squid. Now, God created it all in a moment, but not just that, the birds above the earth, in the heavens, in the expanse. So here we have a juxtaposition of uh, the fish of the sea, uh, the fish in the depths sort of flying along in the waters, and the birds flying along in, in the heavens. Now think about the diversity of birds. There are so many different kinds of birds, all of these created in but a moment. Um, I've always appreciated birds, as I said. I, I'm not like a uh, bird watcher or something, but I always like to see them. Uh, in fact, just uh, this week, I spotted a cardinal out here in the parking lot, and what a beautiful uh, creature that was. Uh, my brother-in-law, I think, is a little bit more of a bird watcher. And uh, some years ago, they had a, uh, my brother and sister-in-law had a bird feeder outside their kitchen window, and they put in a particular kind of seed, and behold, there were all these yellow, these bright yellow birds eating the seed. I, up until that point, had never seen a yellow bird anywhere in Torrington. But there they were. They're there. There are all sorts of varieties of birds throughout the entirety of the world, so much so that we have not cataloged them all, and God created them in but a moment. Look at verse 21. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds. Now, the term that is translated great sea creatures, it's a single Hebrew noun, uh, the noun is tannin, is translated various in the Hebrew Bible, even in the ESV. Um, here I think the ESV is being very conservative with their translation. Elsewhere it would translate the same noun as sea monster, or sometimes great serpent. But the term, uh, and it's translated variously in other English translations, like the King James translates it whale. It certainly does not mean whale, by the way. Uh, the term most literally means dragon. Dragon. Uh, this is a reference to an aquatic reptile, a fearsome reptile, uh, a dragon. And so that, I think, requires some ex explanation. Uh, the term dinosaur is a 19th century word, all right? And it was coined when dinosaurs were, in fact, discovered in the modern era in the 19th century. So uh, the fossils were discovered, and a new term was coined to describe these reptile creatures. But the term that was used before that was the term dragon. That was the sort of basket term for a large foreboding reptile. Uh, and uh, so when we think about dragons, we ought not to just strictly think about some winged beast that, you know, shoots fire, but basically an antiquated term for a dinosaur. Uh, here, the particular term refers to a large aquatic dinosaur. And indeed, the fossil record shows that there were vast, extraordinarily large, powerful, and terrifying aquatic uh, reptiles. For example, uh, there is a, a dinosaur called the Ichthyosaurus. It is massive, probably the biggest creature ever to have lived. Um, they, on the median, were about 30 meters long. That's an incredibly large creature. Humongous teeth, an absolutely terrifying looking a dinosaur which uh, lived in the deep. Uh, there have been uh, fossils of the ichthyosaurus found even within the United States. Uh, so when the United States was covered with water at some point, probably during the flood, these creatures lived upon the earth. Uh, not just the large uh, dragons, as it were, but also the smaller reptiles. This would have been when the crocodile... Uh, when the uh, various sea mammals were created, uh, even the invertebrates like the plankton and the shellfish and, the, and this sort of thing. So great and small, uh, the great sea creatures and every living creature, Moses says, that moves and swarms within the water. Over time, as you go through the Bible, the term tannin or dragon is used quite frequently, actually. Uh, it is translated sometimes just dragon or sea monster. Eventually, it becomes sort of synonymous with 
Satan himself. It's metaphorical. Uh, of course, Satan is kind of like a dragon, is he not? Uh, he is dangerous and powerful, uh, just like a dinosaur. And so, by the time you get to Revelation, uh, Satan is called a, a dragon, a dragon that Christ himself slays. But ask yourself this, and just by way of preface here, throughout civilized history, going back scores of millennia, there are all sorts of legends in all sorts of different civilizations, South America, Asia, Europe, Africa, of dragons, legends of dragons. We are told by the evolutionary crowd that man did not live when dinosaurs lived, uh, that dinosaurs pre-existed human life for hundreds of millions of years. How then, if in fact dinosaurs were discovered in the 19th century, how then were these dragon myths, how did they come into being? And what they point to is a time when man coexisted with dinosaurs and indeed interacted with dinosaurs and, uh, and you get this even a little bit in the Bible. If you would, quickly turn with me to Psalm 74. Psalm 74. And we'll pick it up here in verse 12. Psalm 74 and verse 12. The psalmist writes, Yet God my King is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might, referring to the division of the waters. You broke the heads of the sea monsters. There's that term, ten, and the sea dragons on the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan, and you gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. Leviathan, certainly a reference to a, a dinosaur. We see that again in Job and a few other places in the scriptures. My point here is that there is an awareness of dinosaurs within the text of the Bible. There is an awareness of dinosaurs within all sorts of ancient histories. Dinosaurs and mankind at some point coexisted upon the earth, and that is why we have these le um, dragon legends. Uh, that is why we have this uh, awareness throughout history. Now, the, one other sort of side note here. Where did the bit about the dragons breathing fire come in? Well... Um, these particularly, these breathing fire dragon legends, particularly are found in Northern Europe, especially uh, in the UK, or modern day UK. Uh, there are all sorts of mythological accounts of, you know, these large flying reptiles shooting fire out of their mouth and, you know, knights having to go out in the medieval era to slay them. Uh, well, I'm not going to comment on whether or not those accounts are true. I have my doubts. Uh, but is it really that hard to believe that a dinosaur could have shot fire out of its mouth? I agree. <laughs> Wise child. Uh, it really isn't. Uh, we see this elsewhere within the animal world. For example, the bombardier beetle produces two chemicals within its body that it shoots out and creates fire in an explosion. The bombardier beetle does this not only to uh, scare off would-be predators, it also does this to excavate the ground in order to build a burrow. It's using dynamite, essentially, to build its home. Remarkable. Oh, hail Charles Darwin, right? Yeah, right. No, no, the God of creation designed this perfectly. And so we can see very clearly that if, in fact, there is this phenomenon in nature, it's not that far of a step to say, well, maybe there was a dinosaur that uh, did that. And, in fact, there have been significant studies done on a particular dinosaur uh, that, um, that may have done this. There's some evidence of this within a particular fossil. It's still speculative, but uh, it is not out of the realm of, of possibility. Uh, and so here on day five, we would have had not merely the vast diversity of life in the oceans, the sea creatures, the uh, sea mammals, the whales, the dinosaurs, uh, the various other kinds of reptiles and fish, uh, but we would have also had every winged bird. Now notice that it says according to their kinds, just like on day three. 
the vegetation reproduces according to its kind, right? Plants yielding seed according to their kinds. Trees bearing fruit, which is their seed, each according to its kind. In fact, that phrase, according to its kind, is used almost a dozen times in this account in order to drive home the point that one kind of thing produces the same kind of thing. One kind of thing, one kind of creature, one kind of plant does not produce another kind of creature, plant, or thing. There is an open debate as to what kind constitutes, like what taxonomic category does it refer to, species or genus. Um, I don't think that there's a clear answer, except to say that a kind refers to something that can, in fact, reproduce, reproduce itself. It's reproducibility. That's what's in view here. And so what we have in the creation account, and in fact in all of our scientific data, is that creatures reproduce after their own kind. A dog begets a dog, not a cat. Dinosaurs, reptiles beget reptiles, not birds. This brings us in direct contradiction with the theory of evolution, which dogmatically claims that birds are, in fact, derived from dinosaurs. In fact, uh, one evolutionary biologist at Cornell University goes so far as to say birds are dinosaurs. They're just highly evolved. This is standard fare uh, in terms of evolution. I think it's far-fetched and ridiculous, but it is the standard view and... Let me give you a few reasons why it's not possible. Uh, these are not my reasons. I got them from Dr. David Menton, who is a, uh, a PhD cell biologist. Got his PhD, get this, from Brown University, Ivy League, so no slouch here. Uh, Dr. Menton is a, uh, a devout Orthodox Christian and a young Earth creationist. Uh, just to show you that there are a lot of very well-educated scientists who totally reject evolution. But he gives several significant reasons why it cannot be that birds are, in fact, the product of uh, the evolution of dinosaurs. And the first point he gives is that birds are warm-blooded, in fact, very warm-blooded because of the uh, rate of their metabolism and the frequency in which they move, while dinosaurs and all other reptiles are cold-blooded. This is not a minor change. You're talking about not only a, uh, a vastly different circulatory system, uh, different kinds of, of skin needed within the organs. It's, it's totally different. So to go from cold-blooded to warm-blooded is not a minor transition. You're talking about an entirely different kind of, of creature. And what was the transitional form? Someone who had lukewarm blood? No, it, there's no in-between. You either are cold-blooded or you're... Warm-blooded, there's no in-between, and so uh, what we're talking about are simply apples and oranges. There's no way to get from one to the other. Uh, the other thing he mentions here is that the hip bones and lungs of birds are completely different than that of dinosaurs. Uh, if you've seen a picture of dinosaurs, uh, their hips are outside of their body. Uh, they're visible, um, but birds, not so much. Birds... Uh, their hips are inside their body. It almost has, looks as if they walk on their knees. Um, in order for that to, to happen, in order for a, a dinosaur to evolve into a bird, you're not just talking about different hips. You're talking about an entirely different skeletal structure, an entirely different manner of motion. You ever notice how birds walk? They tend to hop. That is not the way dinosaurs walked. Um, not only that, bird lungs are totally, vastly different than dinosaur lungs. Bird, bird lungs basically look like an elongated tube. Dinosaur lungs look more like our lungs, like a sack. Totally different. And then the last thing he mentions here, he says, while it is common to suggest, even dogmatically, that dinosaurs originally had feathers, he says, there is no evidence of a feathered dinosaur. Maybe you've seen... Uh, modern reproductions of dinosaurs that are feathered. Uh, down in New York City, I recall as a, a junior high student going on a field trip, I saw a, uh, a likeness of a Tyrannosaurus rex covered in feathers. And the claim is that, in fact, the T-Rex, you know, 
uh, instead of a sort of scaly coat, had a coat of feathers. And in this way, the dinosaurs were linked to birds. By the way, T-Rex skin has been found within a fossil. Actual soft tissue of T-Rex skin. Scales, no, no feathers there. That is totally unscientific. You would imagine they would remove those uh, exhibits, but uh, unfortunately they haven't. Uh, Menton goes on, he says, For years it was claimed by evolutionary scientists that the fossil of the Synthosaurus exhibited what they call proto-feathers, a sort of pre-feathers, namely hairs or little filaments that would eventually evolve into feathers. So they claimed that they found a transitional fossil that had something like hairs growing on the outside of it, and that these hairs over time would turn into feathers. Um, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Menton demonstrates that uh, the relevant filaments are not actually hairs at all, uh, but they are connective tissue fibers known as collagen uh, that were derived from the dinosaur's skin. When the dinosaur was crushed, those fibers spread out, just as you would expect anything under pressure to do, and uh, that uh, theory, which was uh, hailed as an important find, has been thoroughly refuted. So there really isn't any evidence that birds are derived from dinosaurs. There, there simply isn't. But this is the dogmatic claim of those who affirm the evolutionary worldview. There is such little evidence for this sort of thing that people have resorted to propagating fakes and frauds. There's so little evidence that people have resorted to coming up with their own uh, sort of conjoled evidence in order to persuade people of its truth. For example, in 1999, so not that long ago, National Geographic magazine held a specimen on its front cover known as the Archaeoraptor. National Geographic said this, quote, is a true missing link in the complex chain that connects dinosaurs back to birds. Here it is. Here's the missing link. Months later, they had to retract the story. It turned out the Archaeoraptor was a fraud. It was a fossil that was comprised of numerous dinosaurs, probably at least two birds, and it had been glued together by someone in China. So they took something fraudulent, put it on the front cover of a popular magazine, a magazine that millions of people read, in order to buttress their evolutionary worldview. It's a fraud. Interestingly, some Christians looked at this, some Christian paleontologists and geologists looked at this and said, normally, with regard to fossils, there needs to be a pedigree associated with these things. Uh, it needs to be disclosed where these things were found in terms of what archaeological dig uh, what part of the earth, uh, uh, there needs to be several people involved with that process. Uh, all of that was avoided and neglected in the finding of this so-called Archaeoraptor. Now, they looked at it uncritically, so desperate were they to come up with some kind of evidence. When you need to resort to frauds, like Archaeoraptor or Piltdown Man, remember that one? That was the alleged transitional uh, creature between you know, lesser creatures and humans, also a fraud. When you have to resort to frauds, your viewpoints are bankrupt. When you have to resort to you know, contrived lies and a mythology, your viewpoint is totally bankrupt. No, birds didn't evolve from dinosaurs. Rather, uh, just like the sea creatures, birds reproduce after their own kind. At the end of verse 21, we see a God delight in his creation, and God saw that it was good. We have not only the diversity of sea creatures uh, now created, we also have the diversity of uh, flying creatures, which would include flying bugs, flying insects, um, other creatures that fly in the world. Think about the diversity of, of just birds alone is remarkable, but think about the diversity of insects, bees, wasps, just countless kinds of insects uh, that would have been created at once. You have everything from the hummingbird to the, the hornet created in but a moment. And by the way, I found this out several months ago, sort of inadvertently, but this is remarkable. You know what a gear structure is? For example, the transmission of your car has a, 
a somewhat complex gear structure where, with synchros and different sized gears in order to uh, drive your car and get it up to speed. Well, gears were discovered allegedly around 300 BC, so 300 years prior to the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there's evidence of gear structures being built in ancient Greece and in ancient Persia. Um, there is a flying insect, sometimes flying anyway, known as the Issus. It's a sap-eating insect, sometimes it's called the leaf hopper, that has a gear structure built into its rear legs. I've seen the picture. It's an actual set of gears built into its hind legs. Gears with synchros and larger gears and smaller gears all meshed together. And this happened on its own? No. No, there is a God who created all these things, an all-wise God who designed it all and created it all in but a moment. And so how do you get to the point where you can look at inherent design, like a gear structure, and say, it got there on its own like that? Because we have to account for the fact that there are all sorts of people who see the same things we see and come to a very different conclusion, namely that this is the result of a godless, purposeless, chance-driven process over the course of many, many millions of years. How do they get there after having looked at these pieces of evidence? How do they look at the genius of birds navigating by the stars and look at that and say, ah yes, evolution? How do they get there? They get there because they want to get there. Evolution was designed as a replacement for the doctrine of special creation. It was designed as an intellectually accessible substitute for the Bible's creation narrative. Darwin even makes claims like this himself. Uh, Thomas Huxley, Darwin's pit bull, does much of the same thing. We need something else. The Bible's creation account is unacceptable. Why? Because it places a demand on man that God will one day judge him for the life he gave. And if you are a rebel, the last thing you want to be is held accountable to by your king. The worst thing for a rebel is to be called to account. As you read through the literature, especially in early Darwinism, there are so many absurdities, absurdities that are still sort of, you know, defended today. For example, you know that Darwin believed that whales were essentially evolved polar bears? And what he claimed was that, you know, polar bears went in the water and didn't come out, and eventually you've, you've got whales. Who would believe that? Someone who wanted to believe that. Someone who was running from the truth. Someone who needed a way of escape from the demands God has placed upon the life of men. Someone who wanted to believe in a strong delusion. And if you rebel against God to that point, he will give you over to your sin. Isn't that what we see in Romans chapter 1? As Paul levels a blanket condemnation upon all mankind, he says, although they knew God, they became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Although God's existence, his divine power is made known to everyone by virtue of what he has created, man suppresses that knowledge. He holds it down because he loves his sin. He suppresses that knowledge and as a result, his mind becomes darkened. Man would rather worship the creature rather than the creator, Paul says. We'd rather worship stuff that God made than God himself. We'd rather worship ourselves. If you think about sin carefully, you'll come to the conclusion inevitably that all sin is in fact the idolatry of the self. It is a putting oneself over in the place and position of God. And evolution is an intellectual band-aid, a poor one at that. 
designed for rebels to pad their conscience, to give themselves a lie so that they can deceive themselves into believing that there is no God, there is no creator. And for that reason, evolution is not merely a secondary issue. No, it is an issue of primary significance. You cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and buy into this teaching. We're drawing a hard line here. How do the creeds begin? One God, the creator of heaven and earth. The reason why Christians emphasize that is because of the place of emphasis that it finds in the Bible. As I've argued to you in the past, if God is creator, he is all wise and he is sovereign. If God is creator, he is Lord. We're not Lord. The creeds emphasize that. And those creeds, by the way, determine who's a Christian and who's not. If you reject those creeds, you're not a Christian. Because those creeds are the accurate summary of the essentials of the Christian faith. That's why the Athanasian Creed, one of the best creeds in existence, begins with whosoever will be saved must affirm these things. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity. Now, the Athanasian Creed, by the way, is really a conflation of all the other creeds. The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Creed of Chalcedon. Uh, so if you want to know more about the creeds, the Athanasian Creed is the one to go to. But this is a, an essential issue. This isn't a secondary or tertiary issue. We cannot compromise on this issue. We need to be making very uh, clear to our children and to those that we have influence over that this is not true uh, and that this is in total contradiction with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ tells us that this Lord created all things by speaking it into existence. This same God became man and died for sinners. You can't have an evolutionary worldview and believe that. It's impossible. It fundamentally cuts out the basis for the Bible story of redemption. It's very significant. So... The fifth day closes in verse 22 with the very first blessing recorded in Scripture. Genesis 1.22, And God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. Notice here that this is the first time that God speaks to a creature. And when he does speak to them, after he is rejoiced, saying, it is all good, he now says, be fruitful and multiply, both to the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the water in the sea, and the, let the birds multiply upon the earth. God's blessing is that these creatures reproduce, which incidentally is the same blessing God gives to humanity in Genesis 1.28. How does God bless by granting progeny. God blesses creatures by allowing them to reproduce. I won't go too far on this, but I will say, and I'll save that for the sixth day, but I will say that today's viewpoint on the having of children is essentially that your life's over when you have kids. That is not in accordance with the blessing of God in creation. That is completely the opposite of be, be fruitful and multiply. What are the implications of this blessing? Number one, note here that the entire creation narrative is leading up to the creation of man. That's the crowning achievement of God in the creation week. The birds are not created uh, as a means or as an end in and of themselves, nor are the fish of the sea. Rather, these are created for mankind. And yet, although it is right and good to use animals, whether fish or birds or whatever kind of animals, the land animals that are created on day six, there is an inherent value to these creatures, not because of what they are, but because of who made them to be what they are. 
you and I get our worth because we're made in the image of God. That's what's value, valuable about you and me. The creatures get their worth because they're creations of God. And for that reason, God enshrines respect in Christian conduct in dealing with animals when in Genesis 9 he says, you're not permitted to eat the blood of beasts. Is that because there's something wrong with blood? No, because life is in the blood. It is a sign of respect to the creatures that God, have, God has created that you abstain from eating blood. That, by the way, is a commandment given to the whole of humanity. That's not like a ceremonial commandment for Jews. No, that is in the account of God's rebuking of creation in the Noahic flood. So there is in the great blessing of God and in the creation of God of these creatures a requirement implicit unto you and I to respect the life that God has created and to deal shrewdly and wisely and compassionately with the creatures God has put on the earth. So this idea that creatures are disposable, that it is good to be cruel to them or something like that, is in fundamental contradiction with the blessing of God that we see described in verse 22. Now, at the same time, we must acknowledge that it is right and good to use the creatures of God for good purposes, uh, whether that be for food or for other purposes, but uh, we must do so with the utmost respect to those creatures because they are made by the most valuable being in existence, our God, the Creator. And then finally, look at verse 23. There was evening, there was morning, the fifth day. A same 24-hour bracket of time, an ordinary day. God has created the great diversity of flying insects and birds and, and uh, aquatic life, mammals and fish and so forth, in but a 24-hour day. So powerful is he, so genius is he that he can design and put all of this in place within the span of a single day. And truth be told, he could have done it quicker than that. The days of creation are leading up to something very important, a symbol. God didn't have to take 24 hours or a week, but he's doing something there. He's doing something to teach man, but it was an ordinary day. And by the way, the birds are created on day five. The land-dwelling dinosaurs are created on day six. Man is created on day six. The birds existed before the dinosaurs, or at least before the land-dwelling dinosaurs. There is a wonderful and awful order to the creation of God that betrays the ungodly theories of men. I pray that day five increases your worship. I pray as you as you look carefully at the genius of God's creation, that you are driven to your knees in awe of the triune God. Let us pray. And now, Father, we give you thanks for your tender mercies. As we think about your creative activity and how Thoroughly you designed this place and the vastness of all the creatures you made and their beauty and the beauty of the birds of the sky and the mystery of the fish of the sea. And yet, despite your wisdom and power, you have for some reason, you have for some reason cared about our redemption and cared a lot because you gave your son. Lord Jesus, we we're gathered here today in somewhat of awe to you because you are so high and elevated above us and yet you have condescended our Creator having become a creature for our sakes. And so we pray this week that we would honor you with our lips, that we would honor you with our actions. We pray that we would live worshipful lives. And grant us frequent repentance. 
and grant us the ability to give the mercy that you provide us to others. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand and sing Psalm 150 with us. You made the starry horse, you traced the mountain peaks, you paint the evening skies with wonder. The earth it is your throne, from deserts to the sea. All nature testifies your splendor. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Sing His greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord, raise your voice. Everything that has breath, praise the Lord. You reach into the dust, love your spirit, breathe. You born us in your very likeness. You know your wondrous works, you know your mighty deeds. To join the As we conclude our worship service today, I want to read to you Christ's concluding words in the Gospel of Matthew, where he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. As you leave this time of worship today, know that the Lord Jesus Christ has promised to go with you, and he's given you a mission to tell others of his greatness. God bless you. Mm -hmm.